Tonight, election day in Georgia. The leaders that we will choose today is going to make that change for us. It's going to make our change for our grandchildren and for our great-grandchildren. The latest as voters head to the polls with the majority control of the Senate hanging in the balance. And then I take it this White House, we're going to fight. As Congress prepares to certify Joe Biden's presidential win, President Trump vows not to give up on election results. Plus, it's nonstop. And it, it has been for the last few weeks, and you know we're all hands on deck. Hospitals are running out of room as coronavirus cases and death rates surge across America. All this and more tonight on Faith Nation. Decision Day in Georgia. Welcome to Faith Nation. I'm John Jessup, and I'm Tara Mergener. The election is coming and all the campaigning comes down to this. Who will Peach State voters elect to serve in the Senate? Polls close in just about an hour from now and as candidates continue their 11th hour push for every vote. That's right. Senior Washington correspondent Eric Phillips has been covering the campaigns since the beginning. He's on the ground in Atlanta tonight to bring us the latest. Eric, you've spent the day talking with voters. Can you set the stage, describe the atmosphere in Georgia and what are you hearing from Georgia voters? Well, John Tarrant, the atmosphere is absolutely energized here in Georgia. Voters I spoke with understand the gravity of this election. What's at stake? The fact that the balance of power in Washington rests on the shoulders of Georgia voters does not escape them. Thus, you can see behind me that there is a number of voters here right now at the Cathedral of St. Philip's Church here in the Buckhead section of Atlanta. There's been a steady stream of people here all day long. No long lines. No problems in terms of voting machines or anything like that. But these voters are serious. They know what their task is, and they're going after it. I spoke to a bunch of them who gave us their thoughts. This is a monumental moment. I'm proud to be a Georgian right now, and I think we're going to make a difference. The law on the line. Some people think it's a big deal, some don't, but I think it's a big deal in my opinion. People are not voting enough, so I feel like it's important to push it to annoy people so that they'll actually go out and do it. Again, I'm here in the Buckhead section of Atlanta, and this is in Fulton County. Why is that important? Because Fulton County has been the recipient of criticism, even coming from the president, about alleged voter fraud and widespread voting irregularities. And so, of course, officials will be keeping a very close eye on how this process works out. Uh, we're not really expecting to hear results when polls close this evening, because there are still a lot of absentee ballots to be counted. And again, Officials are going to take a very meticulous approach to how they run this election. Back to you. Well, certainly, Eric, a lot riding on this. You know, in past elections, areas in Georgia, especially Atlanta, where you've had issues on Election Day, long lines, issues with machines, what is the voting process been like today? Well, the Secretary of State, Brad Raffensperger, has said that so far today, it appears that everything has gone smoothly. We've not heard issues of widespread voting machine problems or long lines. We've been to a few different polling locations throughout the day, both here in Fulton County and in Cobb County. We've not seen long lines anywhere we've been. We've seen people being able to come in and get out relatively quickly. But I think that's a testament to what happened before Election Day. Tara, when you consider the fact that 3 million people, more than 3 million people, voted early in this runoff election, not only is that history setting, but that means not as many people have to come here on Election Day. So you're seeing a very smooth process compared to what it could have been, uh, which could have been mired in a lot of problems. That's just not happened. Eric, speaking of Election Day back in November, it took more than two weeks before Georgia was called for Joe Biden, not to mention two recounts. With control of the Senate at stake, how soon should we expect results of the election tonight? Well, I probably could tell you how soon you should not expect results. I would not expect them at the close of the polls tonight. When exactly it's going to happen is really anyone's guess. I would say anywhere from as soon as tomorrow to as late as the end of the week. I do expect that we will hear some sort of definitive answer on who's winning this contest or who won this contest by week's end. But it could come before then. 
a lot to sort out in the process, though, again, those absentee ballots a key point. All right, CBN's Eric Phillips in Georgia tonight. Thank you so much, Eric. Thanks. Well, a joint session of Congress convenes tomorrow to formally certify Joe Biden as the winner of the 2020 presidential election. But some high-ranking Republican lawmakers say not so fast. That's right, Tara. GOP in both the House and the Senate are planning to challenge the election results. CBN White House correspondent Ben Kennedy joins us now for more. Ben, what's the breakdown there? Well, John and Tara, more than half of House Republicans and more than a dozen senators are expected to challenge those results. But let's break down what tomorrow will look like. At 1 p.m., Vice President Mike Pence will preside over the joint session of Congress. The state vote certification readoff will begin in alphabetical order, starting with Alabama. Objections will need to be in writing. Expected contested states are Arizona, Georgia, Michigan, Nevada, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. These 13 senators plan to challenge the results of the November election when Congress formally counts the Electoral College votes tomorrow. But not all Republicans are on board. 22 GOP senators will support the election outcome, and 16 still haven't given a clear answer. And then I take it this White House, we're going to fight like hell, I'll tell you right now. And I hope Mike Pence comes through for us, I have to tell you. That our great vice president, our great vice president comes through for us. He's a great guy. Of course, if he doesn't come through, I won't like him quite as much. Now, the Electoral College vote uh, certification is normally a drama-free event, takes less than an hour, but this year that is just not the case. We are expecting several hours of a bit of a fight. John, Tara. All right, Ben, no doubt. Any indication what the president means when he says he hopes Vice President Pence comes through? Well, as we mentioned, Vice President Mike Pence will preside over the joint session of Congress. But uh, referring to what Trump was uh, mentioning, uh, uh, Pence does not have the power to overturn the election uh, results. Trump tweeted out uh, today moments ago uh, that Vice President has the power to reject fraudulently chosen electors. Now, the vice president is supposed to open and count the votes. It is in the word count that Republicans are pointing to, and it says the word count might allow Pence to uh, decertify some electors, as Trump was hinting at in that tweet uh, we saw moments ago, and take Biden below the 270 electors needed to win. Of course, we'll find out what Pence uh, does or does decide to do at 1 p.m. tomorrow. Tara, John? All right, CBN White House correspondent Ben Kennedy. Thanks so much, Ben. Well, joining us now is chief political analyst David Brody. David, we just heard Ben give us a little bit of the rundown. Can you walk us through a little bit of the choreography tomorrow? We know that there needs to be written objections, both from the House and the Senate. So what are you anticipating? Right. Uh, so, look, there are about seven states that have these what we call dueling electors. In other words, uh, you have the Biden electors that are certified, and then you have these other seven states that have dueling electors. In other words, the pro-Trump electors. They've been sent to the National Archives. The question then becomes, uh, what Mike Pence is going to do here? Uh, will he, in essence, uh, raise an objection and basically say uh, that these uh, electors uh, should be decertified. These Biden electors should be decertified. Now, of course, we're hearing a lot that he cannot do that. So, so what we're, what's going to end up happening is that you're going to have a U.S. House member, one at least one U.S. House member, and a U.S. Senator, uh, Josh Hawley, most likely, Ted Cruz, possibly as well, uh, object to Arizona's uh, count uh, electors, and then you're also probably going to have uh, the same thing happen with Georgia and Pennsylvania. So there's going to be debate in the House and the Senate at that point for two hours each on those states. So I think you're going to have at least three states. There might be more, but we're understanding there'll probably be at least three states where the House and Senate are going to have to debate. And after that, I mean, I can get into all of this, John, but the bottom line is the House will have the votes to reject the objection, and the Senate will have the votes to reject the objection. And at that point, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, electors will be certified in Joe Biden's favor. A lot of drama, David, and after it all unfolds and the midnight oil flames out, what is the expected conclusion? Many experts and analysts agree that there's no chance virtually of undoing Joe Biden's election win. 
Well, that, that's a little bit more of a complicated question. And the reason I've been kind of hesitant as I've been talking to you both about this is because there's a lot of uh, scenarios that could unfold tomorrow. And you ask about how this could, could end. Well, what Mike Pence could do, and my understanding is that this is being discussed at the level uh, there at the White House, uh, inside the White House, is that Mike Pence could say, uh, in essence, punt it back to the state legislatures and to say, as president of the Senate, in other words, he's the vice president, but as president of the Senate tomorrow, he may just say, uh, these electors are in dispute uh, in Arizona and in Georgia and in Pennsylvania and other places. And he may say, he, he may basically raise a question and say, uh, state legislatures, what are you going to do about it? You've got, uh, these are in dispute. You've got these other dueling electors in these states. And so, you're going to have to figure it out before the Congress can move forward. That may be what he ends up doing, though that would be provocative, obviously, as well. Uh, my sense with Mike Pence, I mean, he's look, he's not a flamethrower. We all know that. Um, he's a, pro a pretty cool, calm, cool, and collected guy. Right. I will say this. Let, let me just say real quick that the, the president tweeting out today that the vice president has the power to do this, to overturn fraudulently ele chosen electors, that puts Pence in a very tough spot. Pence was seen at the White House about an right. hour later. So it's going to be interesting. All right, David, you'll be joining Tara and me tomorrow with live coverage of that vote. Uh, David Brody, thanks so much for your time. Thanks. All right, now to the coronavirus crisis here in America. New warnings. January is already on track to become the deadliest month of the pandemic to date. From the end of December to the beginning of January, the U.S. saw a record number of people killed by the virus, more than 18,400 in just seven days. Meanwhile, infection rates are soaring with nearly 1.5 million new COVID cases last week alone. Many hospitals are at a tipping point as rooms are running out for the sickest patients. If you have someone going into labor or having a heart attack or who gets into a car accident on an icy road, they may not have a bed because the ICUs are full. More than 125,000 in the U.S. are currently hospitalized due to the pandemic. That is up about 25 percent in just a month. Protests and prayers. We explain what's bringing people of faith to march in Washington when Faith Nation returns. Hey, if you're tired and exhausted all day, you can't think clearly, and you really just need a cup or even a pot of coffee to get through your day, then join me, Dr. Josh Axe, for this new series where I'm going to teach you how to transform your diet and use essential oils and supplements to get a better night's sleep. Wake up to your best life. Call 1-800-700-7000 to get your free DVD or booklet of Protect Your Sleep today. It's about the competition. I kind of put that pressure on myself, and I think people had expectations. It's about overcoming. We use this phrase all the time, keep chopping, keep practicing hard. It's about going the distance. You know, I think as a father, it's my job, you know, to lead, just be the best husband and father I can be. Watch Going the Distance with Sean Brown Saturday night at 7.30 on the CBN News Channel. Orphan's Promise is committed to loving and serving at-risk children, to helping keep families together, and to creating opportunities for strong and sustainable communities around the world. We're working in over 60 countries around the world, and with your help, we can do even more. There's an old African proverb I love that says, if you want to run fast, run alone. But if you want to run far, run together. At Orphan's Promise, we want to run far so we can touch the lives of as many orphaned and vulnerable children as possible. But we don't want to go alone. We're out to change the world, one child, one family, one community at a time. Will you join us?
The National Guard is mobilizing here in Washington, D.C., ahead of protests related to the handling of the presidential election. The pro-Trump events are bringing tens of thousands to the nation's capital today and tomorrow. Members of the Proud Boys held similar demonstrations in December, sparking violence and crime in the city, including the vandalization of a number of black churches. To prevent similar outcomes, D.C. Mayor Muriel Bowser is calling up the National Guard, shutting down streets across downtown and urging people to stay out of the area of protest, tweeting, we will do what we must to ensure all who attend remain peaceful. Well, as the nation's capital descends into protests, it's also being lifted up in prayer, along with a Jericho-style march, just like in the Bible, taking place in the next two days in D.C. That's right, John. And as Paul Strand reports today, it included circling the Capitol building seven times. These marchers are praying for elections free of fraud and asking for a thorough investigation of this latest presidential process. They've timed their efforts to coincide with the joint session, hoping to send a message against Congress rubber stamping the November 3rd election results. What is going on right now is something that we never, ever, ever dreamed would happen in this beautiful, wonderful country. This will be an unusual session because of the number of senators and representatives planning to object to counting some of the electors from disputed swing states. Well, then what happens is they temporarily break up the joint session. They go back to the House, they go back to the Senate, and they debate whether or not that objection should be sustained or overruled. Elections analyst Hans von Spakovsky believes there's little chance a majority will back the objectors. So that's the really the last opportunity that anyone has to question the results of, of the election. Uh, as you per know, you know, there's almost no chance of an objection like that uh, succeeding in either the House or the Senate. Vice President Mike Pence will be presiding over the joint session, and some analysts suggest the rules could allow him to unilaterally decertify disputed electors and toss them out. Spakovsky disagrees. He's just in, in uh, overseeing the process of opening and counting the votes. There doesn't seem to be anything in the statute that would give him the authority to actually file an objection uh, to the certification. Still, these demonstrators keep believing that some revelation could possibly change the election outcome, and they insist their concerns and hopes shouldn't be ignored or belittled. The Revolutionary War was about 40,000 people, if I recall, and they literally beat the largest empire in the world. So the church is not a bear that they should have poked. Some here on Capitol Hill say that if the White House was won by fraud and it isn't stopped, that could mark the end of free elections in America. Spakovsky, though, believes that state legislatures have plenty of power and time to investigate and turn things around. They need to use what they find to reform their election process to try to ensure that these kind of problems uh, don't happen again. Paul Strand, CBN News, Capitol Hill. All right, religious persecution around the world. Look at some of the most dangerous places for people of faith in 2021 when we come back. Daddy? Yeah, buddy? How many nickels are in a dollar? There are 20 nickels Look, in a dollar. How do birds fly? Does milk really make my bones stronger? Yeah, yeah. Daddy, when we die, will we go to heaven? Do you have the answer to life's biggest question? Call the 700 Club. We'll help you find answers to the important questions life brings your way. Watch breaking news, in-depth exclusive stories and programs from health to entertainment. You won't find anywhere else the CBN News Channel, a perspective you can trust. Enjoy credible news reporting from around the world. Discover inspiring programs and stories of hope, all in one place from a Christian perspective. The CBN News Channel, a perspective you can trust. To watch the CBN News Channel, download the app or visit CBNNewsChannel.com. Hello, I'm Dr. David Perlmutter, board certified neurologist and number one New York Times bestselling author. Wouldn't it be great to boost your energy, eliminate brain fog, and even reverse brain disease? Well, you can, and I'm going to show you how along with some of the world's most well-respected brain experts in this DVD, Protect Your Brain. Get Protect Your Brain, a free DVD, only from the Christian Broadcasting Network. 
featuring experts on the cutting edge of neuroscience and brain health. No matter how many times you've failed in the past, you really can do this. In Protect Your Brain, you'll discover simple strategies to keep your brain young and healthy. Improve your memory. Discover the gut-brain connection in Protect Your Brain. Get your free copy at CBN.com or call 1-800-700-7000. If you want to improve the quality of your life, get the DVD, Protect Your Brain, and get it today. And welcome back. A federal appeals court seems to be getting ready to remove indoor meeting limitations on houses of worship in California. At the onset of the pandemic, Governor Gavin Newsom banned churches from holding services inside building spaces, sparking cries of religious freedom violations. The issue made its way to the Supreme Court, but was sent back down to the lower court. A three-judge panel on the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals heard arguments Monday on banning indoor services. Why couldn't Tier 1 be, let's say, 10% or 25 people with strict masking, 10 feet distance in the pews between people and uh, no singing. Why, 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 uh, why does it have to be a total ban rather than some tighter restrictions? Two of the three judges on the Ninth Circuit panel are indicating such bans are, unlike, are likely unconstitutional, rather, based on past Supreme Court precedent. All right, it's a new year, but the U.S. is monitoring a number of countries that are continuing their 2020 ways when it comes to violating the rights of their citizens to worship freely. Jennifer Wishon joins us to explain. The persecution of Christians and other peoples of faith across the globe is one of the gravest human rights issues of the new year, and one the U.S. is monitoring closely. And Gail Manchin, who is chairwoman of the U.S. Commission, on International Religious Freedom joins us now. Happy New Year to you, Gail. Thank you so much, Jennifer. And Gail, as we start the new year, uh, give us a sense of what countries are most concerning to the commission. Well, of course, I think at the top of everyone's list is China. And China poses uh, many different problems because it obviously has uh, economic relations with many countries around the world, and yet it continues to trend very poorly in its treatment of religious minorities, particularly uh, the Uyghurs, uh, the detention camps, the uh, harassment, the imprisonment. And so we certainly continue to uh, try to make sure that people are informed uh, about what China's doing and encouraging countries that when they are talking uh, domestic economic policy, that certainly religious freedom should be a part of that discussion and their dealings with China. Well, it's not all bad news. Tell us uh, what countries made improvements in 2020? We look at uh, the country of Sudan and under its uh, new leadership of um, um, Abdallah Hamdok, uh, brought in a, a totally new thought process. Uh, they are not only giving uh, verbal, verbal support to religious freedom, but have really shepherded in, led the way, and followed through on changes that um, the to treatment of women, to uh, religious minorities, to uh, all segments of society. Um, the population who really had suffered tremendously under uh, the former regime. Blasphemy laws are a bit unfamiliar to many Americans, but they're often used in other countries to persecute people of faith. Do you have any hope that some of these laws will be changed in the new year? One of the countries that has really stepped forward, and so it is it's part of the blasphemy law, but it's also part of the good news is you, you speak a stand. They are not uh, trying people and arresting people for blasphemy or apostasy as they have been. We're hoping that they will continue to follow that pattern because it certainly, we hope, would maybe be a model to other countries. And, and Gail, here in the U.S., uh, the promotion of religious freedom abroad has been elevated to the highest level. I know that's something that, that you've been working on and the commission's been working on for a long time. Tell us about that. 
Yes, uh, we were so pleased when Pre President Trump named Sarah Macon as that special uh, liaison to the National Security Council. You know, as I mentioned earlier, when you're dealing with a country like China, that uh, the, the, they're intertwined with other countries in so many different ways. And yet uh, our hope is uh, from you, Surf, that whatever your conversation, whatever your interaction is with other countries, that certainly how that country treats its citizens around religious freedom, basic human rights, would become part of any conversation, national security, economic development, uh, any of those uh, conversations should involve how that country treats its citizens and its people. And so Sarah Macon became a very important piece of that puzzle because for the first time, with that appointment being made, uh, religious freedom now is a part of every conversation. Happy New Year to you, Gail. Thank you. Regents first ROTC graduate student. Five, four, three, two, one. I'm Ephraim Graham. Welcome to Studio Five. Get on it. All that's new and now in the world of uplifting entertainment with celebrity interviews. There's a higher contribution I will make. Musical performances. I'll give you my best praise. Plus movie and TV news. See it and be uplifted. On Studio Five. Every Wednesday at 5 p.m. Eastern at CBN.com forward slash Studio Five. How would you like to get a redo on your health? on your body, on your arteries, so you could have the energy you had 20 years ago. The great news is you can. I'm Dr. Mike Roizen, chair of the Wellness Institute at the Cleveland Clinic. I've written four New York Times bestsellers, but even better than having to read all that, you can listen to this DVD and watch it. Protect your heart? Yes, you can. Here's how. Go to CBN.com or call 1-800-700-7000 for your free copy of Protect Your Heart. Let the medical experts show you their new discoveries on how to avoid heart disease and even reverse it. Easy steps to uncover the hidden dangers in your medicine cabinet, reduce stress, and get a complete do-over for your health. Call 1-800-700-7000. That's 1-800-700-7000. Or go to CBN.com to claim your free copy of Protect Your Heart. All right, final light tonight. We've all been there, right, John? You get a little hungry, you head to the vending machine, you pop in some money and a snack, conveniently comes right to you. Not the vending machine in our office. <laughs> uh, but while now that same convenience has made its way to the fight against the coronavirus, UC San Diego has installed vending machines filled with do-it-yourself COVID tests. Students there are required to test once a week. Now they can just head to one of the campus vending machines and grab a free self-administered test kit. After a quick swab, they leave their kit in a drop box and wait for the results to return within about two days. Many students say they like the vending machines because they're convenient, quick, and easy. Tara, what's your take? You're still hungry, though, at the end of it, John. Where's the Snickers? <laughs> i got to agree with you there. Well, thanks for watching, Faith Nation. We'll see you tomorrow.